Now we're going to move into something called electronegativity. So I have some explanation of that here on this slide. I encourage you to look at it, but let me just kind of explain it by looking at this chart and then going through some examples here. Okay, so electronegativity is a way of evaluating if you have a pair of electrons that is between the nuclei of atoms, what is that pair of electrons attraction to a particular nuclei of a specific atom? The way you judge that is on a numerical scale from zero to four. It's called electronegativity scale. So if the electronegativity is zero, what that means is that that atom with electronegativity of zero, it has no attraction whatsoever for a shared pair of electrons in a bond. On the other end, if you have an atom with an electronegativity score of 4.0, which is the highest score you can have, then it has the strongest attraction for a shared pair of electrons in the bond. So one thing that you should kind of be aware of is which atoms have the lowest electronegativities and which ones have the highest. And so I just want to point out where those atoms are on this uh, uh, periodic table here. So if you go to the lower left end, if you go to the heavier alkali metals like cesium here and francium, they have the lowest scores of electronegativity. They have scores of about 0.7 which means that they have relatively weak attraction for a share of pair of electrons. And so one of the things you'll notice in general, as you go up a group of elements, the electronegativity score tends to go up, meaning the atom will have a stronger attraction for a share of pair of electrons. But then let's say you go all the way up to period say two with lithium here. So lithium has electronegativity score. It's a little higher, it's 1.0. If you go across period two here, from lithium to beryllium to boron, boron's electronegativity score 2.0, carbon's a little higher at 2.5, then nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine has the highest electronegativity score of 4.0. So as you go across the period, the electronegativity scores go up. Those atoms have stronger attractions for a shared pair of electrons. So some of the things that you might remember is that as you go up a group, the electronegativity tends to increase. And as you go across a period from left to right, the electronegativity also tends to increase as well. There are some values I suggest you memorize. So I suggest that you memorize the electronegativity of cesium and francium, or just the elements on the lower left end of the periodic table they have the lowest number at 0.7. And then if you can memorize that fluorine on the upper right end of the periodic table has the highest electronegativity, um, it has a score of 4.0. You can't get any higher than that. And then also what would be kind of useful to remember is the middling ones. <laughs> so for example, carbon is sort of a middling score. Carbon has a score of a 2.5. So if you can remember that, it's sort of between that of fluorines and then the lower scores of cesium and francium, that would be good. And also, if you can remember hydrogen score of 2.1, which is a little bit lower than carbon, that can be helpful as well with certain questions. And I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so I have sort of here on this chart here, this just points out again that electronegativities of the atoms increase when you go up the group or you go from left to right on the period. Okay, so now I want to talk about the consequences of electronegativity. So I think the best way for me to explain this is to go to the light board. Okay, so what electronegativity does, it determines if you have a molecule, what the polarity of the bond is. So I'll speak to what polarity is in just a second, but let me just go over a few examples. So let's look at diatomic chlorine again. And so let me draw a Lewis dot structure for that. So the Lewis, well, this is just, excuse me, the electron dot structure is what I should be calling it now. So here's the electron dot structure for diatomic chlorine. So we figured that out earlier. This is what it looks like, right? Now let's compare that to another covalent compound, a molecular compound. It's not here diatomic chlorine, it's just hydrochloric acid, HCl. What would that look like in terms of a dot structure? Well, you can work it out, it looks like this. Hydrogen has a single valence electron, 
it'll be shared with chlorine, and then chlorine has its seven valence electrons. So this is a good structure for HCl. So now I want to try to draw a three-dimensional picture of these molecules. I'm laughing because it's going to look lame. <laughs> so here is my three-dimensional picture of chlorine. It looks like that. Two chlorine atoms bound together like that. I know that's pretty lame. And so let me draw my three-dimensional picture of hydrochloric acid. So hydrogen has a smaller atom, so this will be smaller and it'll be bound to chlorine. It looks like that. So that's the best I can do with that. Okay. So now the cool thing is electronegativity is a score that can tell you where a shared pair of electrons spends in between, in time, between these different atoms. So here I'm going to look at this diatomic chlorine. And so we have a shared pair here. I'm going to put that here. So keep in mind that there are lone pairs that surround the chlorine nucleus. We're going to ignore those. We're just going to look at the shared pair here. Here in this molecule, let's just focus on the shared pair here um, between hydrogen and chlorine. So let's look at the scores of electronegativities. And so chlorine, you can look up the electronegativity. So this chlorine has electronegativity of 3.0. This chlorine will have the same electronegativity here. Um, here in HCl, this hydrogen has electronegativity of 2.1. This chlorine has electronegativity of 3.0. What are the implications of that? Well, this is again a ranking of a atom's nuclei's attraction to the shared pair of electrons. So you can see that both these chlorines, because they both have electronegativity of 3.0, have an equal attraction for the shared pair of electrons. So the shared pair of electrons will wander around, but because both are chlorine nuclei, they will wander around equally between the two different chlorine nuclei. So basically the electrons will do this. We have a shared pair, they're gonna wander around the molecule. So they'll spend some time on the left, some time on the right. And so they'll just kind of wander around equally between these two atoms here. So this is the shared pair. And again, I'm trying to represent the shared pair spends equal time between these two chlorine atoms. Now, let's look at hydrogen chloride. What does this shared pair do in light of the fact that chlorine has electronegativity of 3.0, but hydrogen has a lesser electronegativity, it's 2.1. What are these shared pair electrons going to do? Well, what you might imagine is that they're gonna to wanna to spend more time around the nuclei, the chlorine here, with the higher value of electronegativity, and they do that. So what happens is the shared pair spends a fair amount of time around chlorine, but just a little time around hydrogen. So most of the time the shared pair spends around chlorine, but just a little bit time around hydrogen. So what are the implications of this in terms of how the electrons are balanced around the molecule? So this shared pair of electrons is spending time around both atoms, but it spends most of its time around chlorine. So that gives the chlorine atom a bit of an excess of electrons or a bit of an excess of a negative charge. Now it isn't going to be a full integral value of negative charge. It is going to be a value of negative one, but it's going to be a slight excess of electron density for this chlorine atom more than normal. And if that's the case, the way we indicate that is if the chlorine has a slightly excess of electron density, then this will be delta negative end. Um, hydrogen, because this shared pair of electrons is spending most of its time around this chlorine and not so much time around the hydrogen, hydrogen is said to have a relative deficiency of electron density. And so this is going to be a delta positive end of the molecule. Now, the question is here with the molecular chlorine, if the shared electrons are spending equal amounts of time around these two chlorines, is there one side um, that has more electron density than the other? And the answer is no. So there's not going to be a delta negative side or a delta positive side. You just don't write delta negative or delta positive because the shared electrons are equally spending time around both chlorines. Now, if you have a bond here with a shared pair of electrons and the shared pair of electrons are spending equal amounts of time around the atoms here as they're doing here, this is called a nonpolar covalent bond. On the other hand, if you have a molecule where you have a shared pair of electrons, but they're spending a lot more time around one atom than the other, 
then this is no longer called a non-polar covalent bond. It's called a polar covalent bond. So you might wonder what the word polar means. So polar, when applied to an object, indicates that that object has a side or different sides. So for example, on the planet Earth, we have a North Pole and a South Pole, and they're different from one another. The North Pole has a big chunk of iron where all the uh, magnetic needles are pointing to, and the South Pole doesn't have it. So the North Pole is different than the South Pole. So when you have poles, that means you have a one end that's different than the other. So here we have a polar covalent bond. It's because one end of this molecule is different than the other. The end with the most electron density is chlorine. The other end, hydrogen with less electron density, electron deficiency, is different. So this is polar covalent. This is nonpolar, and the reason is no end is any different than the other. They're exactly the same because electrons are spending equal amounts of time around those atoms. Okay, so one thing you're going to have to do is arithmetically judge whether the bond between atoms is a nonpolar covalent or whether it's a polar covalent. And so the way you do that is you look at the difference of electronegativity atoms between the atoms. So if you look at it, the difference of electronegativity of the atoms and the scores between 0 and 0 0.4, it is considered a nonpolar covalent bond. If the score, the difference of electronegativity is from 0 0.5 to 2.0, this is a polar covalent bond. And then if you have a difference of electronegativity between the atoms, it's going to be greater than 2.0. That is actually going to be an ionic bond. So let me show you a picture of that. So going over here, um, we see the three different kinds of bonds evaluated in terms of their polarity. So if you look at the left side of this diagram here, what we have are two atoms of equal electronegativity that are bound together. And you see there is no delta positive or the negative end. And so here, if that is the case, then you have a nonpolar covalent bond. You can only have that, again, if the electronegativities of these two different atoms are pretty close to one another, such that the difference of electronegativity is between 0 and 0 0.4. So now here in the middle here, we have a case where we have an atom on the left which has a greater electronegativity than the atom on the right. And the difference in electronegativity between these two atoms is going to be between 0.4 and 2.0. When you have that difference, the electrons in the middle between these two atoms are shared. It's just that they spend a lot more time around the atom with more electronegativity than the time with the less electronegativity. So this bond is considered polar. Now, if the electronegativity difference between the atoms is so great that it's beyond 2.0, it can go all the way up to 3.3, if that is the case, the atom with the greater electronegativity it will actually not share electrons with the atom with the less electronegativity. Instead, you will have complete electron transfer from that one atom with the lesser electronegativity with the atom to the greater electronegativity. So a perfect example of that would be sodium chloride. Chlorine has electronegativity of 3.0. Sodium, if you look up its electronegativity, is 0.9. So the difference in electronegativity between sodium and chlorine is 2.1. It's so great, it predicts that one of sodium's electrons will leave it and go to chlorine. And when they do, they get absolutely charged and they form an ionic bond. Here is just sort of, I guess, a table of what I just kind of mentioned on the board. So I'll let you look at that on your own time. Um, the last thing I want to mention now is on your test, you're going to have to evaluate that. When you have two atoms bound together, you're going to have to figure out what the polarity of that bond is based on the difference of electronegativities of the atoms that are bound together. So I want to do a few examples of this. So you can look up the electronegativity of barium. So I find the electronegativity of barium is 0 0.9, right? And the electronegativity of chlorine is 3.0. And so you're going to have to figure out if there's a bond that forms between barium, which is a metal, and chlorine, which is a nonmetal, 
is that going to be a non-polar covalent, a polar covalent, or ionic bond? So the difference in electronegativity, you can just subtract the greater value minus the lesser value. And so here I get 2.1. So that difference of electronegativity indicates that the bond that forms between barium ion and chloride ion is going to be an ionic bond. Okay, how about carbon and oxygen? So carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5. Oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. Okay, so what is the difference of electronegativity here? So it's just the larger number minus the smaller one. 3.5 minus 2.5 is going to be equal to 1.0. So if the difference of electronegativity between carbon and oxygen is 1.0, what that indicates is that that bond between carbon and oxygen will be a polar covalent bond. And so what will happen is the shared pair of electrons between carbon and oxygen, because oxygen has a slightly higher electronegativity of 3.5, um, they'll be spending more time around oxygen than carbon. How about carbon and hydrogen? Carbon has electronegativity of 2.5, hydrogen has electronegativity of 2.1. So the difference of electronegativity here is just the largest number minus the smallest. So it's 2.5 minus 2.1. So it should be equal to 0.4. So when you have an electronegativity difference of 0.4 between two atoms, that puts it on the line between a nonpolar covalent bond and a polar covalent bond. Okay, so thank you for listening to that presentation and we will do more later.